Thank you for tuning into Stepping Stones of Faith. Stepping Stones of Faith is a ministry of Claytonville United Brethren Church. Our service times are as follows. Sunday morning Sunday school starts at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship starts at 10.30 a.m. If you would like to join us for any of these services, our address is 106 Elizabeth Street, Claytonville, Illinois, 60926. We hope to see you this morning. We are going to continue in our study in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11. Paul chapter, Paul, Paul's uh, dealing with the false apostles here in chapter 11. He starts off and he says, now understand this is a long chapter, so we'll probably do one section and then the second section next week. But he says, I would not, I would to God to you, that you could bear with me a little more, a little in my folly indeed, bear with me. For I am jealous over you with je godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, and that I may present you as a, as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear that somehow as the serpent deceived Eve through his trickery, so your minds might be led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if, he, if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might submit it readily enough. Submit to it readily en enough. Now, I'm going to stop there a moment. Understand Paul's situation here. We've established in a lot of different weeks here that Paul writes these books to the churches pr primarily to, in to set them straight but then to encourage them to keep going. And that's what he's kind of doing here. He's setting them straight, and he's kind of encouraging them in the same way. I would to God that you bear with me a little in my folly. Indeed, bear with me. He's getting ready to talk to them. He says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, what does that mean? Let's look at that phraseology for a moment. A chaste virgin to Christ. In the biblical sense, what he is saying is they are not soiled by false teaching. They're not soiled by false teaching. They're, they are, um, they know the gospel, they know Jesus, and they know him fully and they understand that. But he's afraid and he's talking to them about false apostles, false teachers who come about and share a different gospel, a different Jesus, a different understanding of Scripture that isn't in Scripture whatsoever. If they accept that and they follow that, then they are no longer chaste. Or in Paul's words, they're no longer a virgin to Christ. Because they've accepted another gospel. They've accepted another teaching that goes against the teachings of Christ. And so when we think about this today, how can we parallel this to 2022? Well, we, what we can do is we can see that with the, with the availability of a global reach, which is the internet, and the availability of having some sort of technology right at your fingertips. It's very simple for false teachers to get into your heart and into your homes because they're literally right there. 
I don't have my phone here today, but you can literally pick up your phone and get on a social media app or get on a website and you can go to anybody and hear anybody's theology. And some of them are not, are not written or, or set in scripture. There's a gentleman who calls himself a prophet who has a big following. He's a false prophet, by the way. But if you look at his bio, bio or his bio, his bio or whatever they call it, his information, he has no schooling. He has no theological degree. He has no theological understanding except for what he has put forth for himself. And so therefore, a lot of what he says is false. A lot of what he says is in fact false. And so, and so many people are buying into that. What does it say about the scripture? It says even the very elect will be deceived. And so we have to guard ourselves against that. And Paul is talking to them about <clears throat> the presence of false teachers. He dealt with this all through the scriptures. Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus. He dealt with it all through the scriptures. False teachers, false doctrines, false gospels. But I fear that somehow as the serpent deceived Eve through trickery, so your minds might be led astray from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now let's look at Eve's deception, or the, the deception with Eve. What did the serpent do? He used God's words, didn't he? But he switched them around. He asked her, well, did God say you weren't supposed to eat of the tree? Well, yes, we're, we're not supposed to even touch it. God never said they weren't supposed to touch it. They were supposed to tend it, but they couldn't eat of it. So in that trickery, he confused her to thinking it sounded so good, but then she went ahead and bit the apple. So he's saying, or the fruit, whatever it was. They say apple, but could have been anything. But uh, he says that they have been tricked just like the serpent tricked Eve from, this, from the simplicity which is Christ. Now how, how simple is Christ in this gospel? Very simple. It's very simple, isn't it? Jesus came, virgin birth, lived a sinless life, ministered for three and a half years, died on the cross, and on the third day rose again, and to be born again and to be with him, we have to accept that, turn away from our sin, and walk in his way the best of our ability. And we, we, we set our will with God's will and not our own. That's how simple it is. But sometimes things get switched around. I mean, look at the Judaizers in Galatia. They said, oh, it's great that you're a Christian, but you still have to follow the law. You still have to follow the Torah. You can follow Jesus, but you have to also have to follow the Torah. Jesus came to fulfill the law, not that all of the law is, is then abolished. It's not abolished, it's fulfilled. There's a difference. But they were adding to it, making it more complicated, making it more hard to do. The fo following Christ is very simple. You just follow. You read the Bible, you pray, and you do what you're told. That's basically what you're supposed to do. It's very simple. But false teachers can make it very, very difficult. And they can make it sound so good and so wonderful, the things they're saying, but it's not really scripture. And he's saying that he's, he's been, he's afraid that this is what's happening, ha ha happening with them. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might submit to it readily enough. So that speaks to their, that speaks to their understanding a little bit of what they already know. Why would they turn away? Well, the serpent tricked Eve, didn't he? So they use phraseologies. These, these, these false teachers use phraseologies. They use things that sound good. 
But there's little, there's little bit of nugget and a whole lot of lie. And that's what he's afraid of here. That because they, they accept this, they so readily will turn to it and submit to it because it sounds so good. You see, a lot of these false teachers probably back then and even today, they play on things. You know, we have a lot of false teachers now around the, the political realm who say the political realm is, is ran by demons and, and all these things, especially around a former president. Our former president has been put into the theologies of a lot of Christians. They look to him as a messiah. He is not a messiah because of the things that have happened. And so many people are becoming deceived because of what sounds good. And these people play on the feelings and the hearts of the people that people, what people want to see happen, especially Christians. We must understand that there is a lot of things that are not scriptural. Did you know that kingdom now theology is not scriptural? Kingdom Now Theology is a theology that believes and says that we have to have a Christian running every office in the land. We must have a Christian president. We must have a Christian Congress. We must have a Christian state government. We must have a Christian city government. That's Kingdom Now Theology, and that is not biblical. Everybody wants it. All Christians want it, but it's not biblical. It's not biblical. And it makes you want to look at why do they want it? Why do I want this? It's because it's what I want to see happen for me a lot of times. I want my Christian rights given back to me. I want my Christian liberties renewed. Well, guess what? What does it say in the scripture? It says that America is not even in the Bible. It's going to get worse before it gets better. It's not going to get better on this earth. But everybody says, we, you hear about second wave, second awakening, uh, all these things. Okay, fine. God can do that. I'm not saying God can't do that, but I don't see a scriptural precedent for it. Sounds good though, doesn't it? A second great awakening, revival happening and people coming to the Lord and God turning things around and turning the country around and turning, it sounds wonderful. Sounds good. But where's the biblical precedence for it? There is none. Not for this day and age. The only thing Bible the Bible tells us to do is to watch and pray. And be ready. And the question we've got to ask ourselves is, are we ready? Should that trumpet sound and the angels shout, would we be with Jesus? We've got to ask ourselves that question. He says, verse 5, For I think I am not in any way inferior to the most eminent of the apostles. Even though I am unpolished in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. All things about us have been thoroughly revealed to you. Did I commit a sin in abasing myself? that you might be exalted because I preach to you the gospel of God free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting wages from them to serve you. Furthermore, when I was present with you and was lacking, I was a burden to no one. And that's something we can think about for a moment. These so-called prophets, preachers, teachers, false teachers, this day and today, what, are, what do they want? What do they want? You preach the gospel. He said he preached the gospel. He was a burden to no one. He provided for himself or he took what was given and that was it. False teachers in this day, false teachers today, what do they do? Send me your money. Send me your money. 
If you send me a thousand dollars, God will bless you a hundredfold. I hear I've heard that so many times. If I had a dime for every time I heard that, I'd be a rich man, right? But is that biblical? No. Paul says he did this and he was not a burden to no one. He said he was why he 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 said, furthermore, when I was present with you and was lacking, I was a burden to no one. So he was in lack. And he was a burden to no one. Either they were led by God to give him what he needed, or he just took what was given and used it. Would to God that so many preachers would do that today. Instead of wanting their jets and their mega churches and their security teams and their worship teams and all these things. Whatever happened to standing in a pulpit and just proclaiming the word of God for what it is, the word of God, and not desiring or wanting all these things. I've told this story here before, but I can remember a time when there was an evangelist coming into one of the churches I was affiliated with, and he had to have he had to have the best hotel, the best room in the hotel, and he had to have a certain vehicle pick him up, and he had to have the temperature be a certain thing. And why? That's not biblical. What was wrong with the local motel? What was wrong with somebody picking you up in a truck? What was wrong with that? No, we had to have a certain car, the best room in a certain hotel. Temperature of the car had to be a certain degree. Why? This is being a burden. That's being a burden on other people. And not only that, the church I was affiliated with pay, paid, for the, paid for the hotel room, paid for his meals. He had nothing to be concerned about along with that. And they paid him. They paid to fly him out. And then they paid him, uh, paid him money on top of all of that. A certain dollar amount. I mean, there was a specified amount they had to pay. It wasn't a love offering kind of thing. It was, you have to give me X amount of dollars Plus, you have to pay for my flight, my hotel room, my meals, all these things. That's being burdensome. It's being burdensome. Paul said he did all of that and he was lacking and he was a burden to no one. He goes on. And he says, uh, lost my place. Yes. I served other churches by accepting wages from them to serve you. Furthermore, when I was present with you and was lacking, I was a burden to no one. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I'm, I lacked. In all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so will I keep myself. So he had provisions. So he wouldn't be a burden to those he's ministering to. The brothers from Macedonia provided for him. Now, did he ask that? It doesn't say that he said, well, I require this. They, did, they knew what he was in need of and they provided it willingly. There's a difference there what we have going on today. He says, In all things, I have kept myself from being a burden, burdensome to you so that I keep my, so 
will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love because I do not love you. God knows. And I will continue doing what I am doing, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire the, an opportunity to be found equal to us in what they boast about. For such are false apostles and deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his, if his ministers also disguise themselves as, themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Now, let's look at that for a moment. Now, what is he saying? He's calling false teachers the workers of Satan. That's pretty harsh. So, Think about that today. You have all your TV preachers and your TV apostles and all these things, right? What, what would you, what would you, what do you think would happen to you or to me or to somebody else? Actually, I've experienced this. If I've said this person's a false teacher, this person's a false teacher. I've not said he's a worker of Satan, but I've said he's a, this person or that person is a false teacher. And boy, did I get a lot of black backlash from that. You see, what happens is people, when they follow these things, when they follow these people, they begin to be invested emotionally, spiritually, and physically because they're giving money. And so they don't want their investment to be in vain. And so when somebody confronts them with the truth, of course there's going to be pushback because they're invested. But as Paul said here, this is not a new thing today. It's a very old thing. People will always come out of the woodwork and claim to be apostles, claim to be prophets, claim to be of Christ, and you can know them by their works. What does it say? By your fruits, they shall know you're my disciples. What is their fruit? False prophets don't have any fruit. They have a withering tree that at some point Jesus will cut down and throw into the everlasting fire to be burned up. That's what they have. And it's up to us as believers, to understand and know and to, to, to understand the scripture enough to say, well, that's not of the Bible. I was having a conversation with someone the other day who said that they had a conversation with someone and they said there's going to be a great awakening and it's going to be, that's never happened before and it's going to be the same as it was in the book of Joel, this great awakening, this great revival or whatever, it's going to be, I said, well, that's already been fulfilled. Well, what do you mean? So I showed this person, book of Acts, chapter 2, when the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter said this was fulfillment of Acts, of uh, Joel, and fulfillment of Joel. It's already been fulfilled. If it happens again, it's not something new, it's something that God is doing again, but we don't see a precedent of that yet. So many things that we hear and we see that sound so great, but is not biblical. It's not biblical. We've got to know this. We've got to know what it says. We've got to know it. Paul, I like what he says here. He's kind of giving them kind of a spiritual dressing down. And he says, as the truth of Christ in me, this is verse 10, as the truth of Christ in me, no one shall stop me from boasting in the religions of, uh, in, the, in, in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you. He's saying, you don't think I love you? I'm doing this because I do love you. God knows. 
God knows I love you. So then you look at these false prophets today and back then. Why do they do what they do? What is their, where is their love coming from? They desire, as the Bible says, filthy lucre or money. They desire money. How can I line my pockets? How can I use this? And some of them might actually, some of them might actually be deceived like Eve was and think they're saying the truth. See, that's the thing. <laughs> you don't know. Some of them that are false prophets might be being deceived themselves, thinking they're being speaking for God when they're not. Because the enemy does come as an angel of light. The enemy does come as an angel of light. Some of them could be unknowingly share, sharing a false gospel, and some of them could be very much know what they're doing in sharing a false gospel for their own personal gain. But in either, either way, they're in it for their own personal gain. They don't know their scriptures. They can quote them, but they don't have a deep, deep understanding of God. The Bible talks about having the deep things, of knowing the deep things of God. Do we know the deep things of God as believers? If we can say, well, maybe. If we can say, well, not really. That's an indication for all of us, even me, that I need to be getting closer to God. I need to be getting closer to God Verse 13, he says, For such are false apostles and deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministry also disguise, ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So those that are doing this, whether, well, whether intentionally or unintentionally, will be dealt with correctly with God. We hear about that in the scriptures where it says, where Jesus is talking about those that say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. For I never knew you. I would, the indication there is that those people didn't realize they were doing the wrong thing. Probably some of these false prophets and apostles and all that probably don't realize they're doing the wrong thing. Some of them probably are well aware of what they're doing, thinking it can't happen to them. But in the end, they will get their reward or their punishment. And they'll be sent out to Everlasting fire and punishment and hell because they really didn't know God. And the question is, do we really know God? That's the question we've got to ask ourselves today as individuals. Do I really know God? Am I equipped enough to minister to those who need to minister to? Do I know the scripture well enough? Do I know the concepts of the scriptures? Do I know the precepts of God? enough to where I am unwittingly, I am not unwittingly giving false teaching and false doctrine. And that's a question I ask myself, not just you. And that should guide us into the scriptures even more to look and to study and to understand. Ask God to give us direction and understanding in his word. If we don't do that, then there's a problem. We will end up in a lake of fire if we don't know God. We might think we do, but do we? It's a question we've got to ask ourselves. Do we really know God? And not only ask that question, but also ask God, do I really know you? And if I don't, show me where I can remedy that, 
or correct that. It's important. And when he shows it to you, then you apply it. Then you move forward in God. Because that question will always be there, haunting us. Do I really know God? Do I really know God? That's a question we're going to be asking ourselves to the day we meet him, but the question should stay in our minds. Do I really know God? You know why it should stay there? Because it should invoke us to more prayer. It should invoke us to more reading. It should invoke us to more times together as a family, to know God in a real way. That's why we should, that question should always be there. Do I really know God? I don't know. Well, then you pray and you ask God and you read and you begin to know him more. The more we know him, the more we love him. And the more we love him, the more we want to know him. And it's a cycle that continues through our Christian walk. But we have to know and understand that we have to ask that question, do I really know God? And I ask that question of myself, do I really know God? I like to think I do, but I don't know him the way I would want to know him. That's a lifelong process. That's a lifelong of faith and, and faithfulness of God in our lives. Do we really know God? That is the question we've got to ask ourselves as individuals and as a church body. Do we really know God? If that answer is anything but yes, that should invoke us to more prayer, more study, more time with his people. So we know God. Amen? Does that make sense? I pray that it does. Let's go before the Lord. <clears throat> Father, we thank you today, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Father, help us to know you more. Help us to desire you with a thirst that can only be quenched by your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to look into your scriptures, to delve into the deep things of God to get greater understanding. And Father, minister to us by your Spirit. Father, bless us with great understanding as we study your word. Bless us with boldness. And bless us, Father, with appointments with others to share your word with boldness. Give us opportunity to share your word. Give us opportunity to pray with others. Give us opportunity to be Jesus to someone who needs the Lord. Father, and we thank you for that. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to Stepping Stones of Faith. I pray that you find value in this content. You can also find an audio podcast of this program on all the major podcasting platforms. Just type Stepping Stones of Faith into the podcast search bar. Once again, I'm Pastor Josh. Thank you for joining me today.